that it's like if you replaced everyone with uh, blondes versus brunettes. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Roger. And welcome to The Middle, where we try to have thoughtful conversations about awkward topics on our search to find the middle. We're going to give you last week's news today. Um, it's so it's, um, it's a slogan we should put on the t-shirt. Stop touching her! I am tonight announcing my candidacy. Taylor Swift. Look, my biggest issue with marriage is that I think that it's a fundamentally flawed institution that is built on the oppression of women. I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny. Having truly rational conversations about controversial issues is risky these days. Roger. Andy, how you doing? Pete, you again. Well... Talk about the election being divisive. We have had quite a, um, a scathing review pointed your way <laughs> from, from yep. one of our regulars. And now, um, if you're listening, Jill, uh, you've been throwing us a few comments actually on our YouTube channel. Uh, and there's been, I feel, a building tension, uh, especially in regards to the US election coverage. And a little bit, shall I say, pointed towards our friend Andy over here. And I think it's reached a bit of a, a boiling over point in terms of nicety. So uh, how about I hit you with this um, this listener question or maybe maybe comments is the is the more likely characterization. All right, hit me. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to kind of read it word for word here. So this is from Jill and it's directly after our VP debate episode that was released uh, yeah, midweek. You guys need to stop doing US election episodes. I'm worried there won't be a show left by the end of it. I've listened since the show was in single digits. Andy, at this point, you've betrayed everything the show has stood for. Moralizing, saying Roger is confused because he doesn't immediately denigrate Trump the first chance he gets, and the hide, in capitals, to say he needs to be re-educated and read books, which is a, the exact, in capitals, <laughs> thing that you pushed against by wokesters in episodes gone by, condescending. You do realize Rogers said he wouldn't vote for Trump. You are totally going to lose it. Personally, <laughs> I'm a lifelong Democrat and voting blue, but all my family and in-laws are red. I would never treat them like this. This isn't a bad example of what your show is preaching. <laughs> I expected better. And this is now in caps. I know Americans are better. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> We know the difference between Iran and Israel. All right. Firstly, Jill, suck it up. <laughs> it's a podcast. Me and Roger are mates. We're bantering. We're, we're, we're on the same page, right? We're friendly, right? It's, it's, friendly, it's friendly fire. Okay. So um, let, let's walk through a few of these uh, systematically. So I might, I might like actually go to the, the last one first, which is that Americans, do they know the difference between Iran and Israel? You know, in, in case, I don't know if um, sarcasm or, um, you know, kind of, is it, what is it, what's the thing that doesn't translate into American humor? Like that, that whole British sort of. Yeah, dry um, humor. That, yeah, sarcasm. I, dry I humor. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it is, but to my American friends, yes, I, I concede you probably on average do know the difference between Iran and Israel. But um, in, in that debate, uh, Tim Waltz didn't, uh, as it seems. So um, there you go. Okay. So first things first, uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll give Jill that um, I'm definitely irritable when it comes to the topic of Trump and anything Trump adjacent, because Trump wasn't even in the debate last <laughs> night. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't know if triggered's the, the right word or, um, you know, tr Trump derangement syndrome. May maybe it is to describe a phenomena of this nature. But, you know, and I think I said in the episode, and, you know, and, and I'll apologize to you, Roger, um, I probably was condescending, but maybe in jest, <laughs> right? So not, not in a, um, you know, and I hope, I hope as a, as a co-host, uh, you know, inspiring partner, you, you, you know, when I'm, I'm being serious and when I'm uh, being playful, but uh, I, I made a comment where I said something like that, um, you know, that, that there's a notion of like, what's true North, right? And that you can be what you perceive as true North. But like if you're a degree or a couple of degrees off, you know, it's it's like the compass just doesn't look right. And I think that's what I'm reacting to. Now, of course, I could, it could be my compass that's, that's off. So, and that's the thing, you, you only see the world through the way you see it, right? So, and if you're a little bit off, then you see everyone else as being a little bit off. But it, on this occasion, like I, I think, you know, it, the needle is when it comes to Roger, I think 
it is it is broadly pointing north. So it, it's mostly okay. But there's just that, that one or two degrees where I think we are slightly different. And it, and I've got OCD about it. I, and I obviously do, right? Because I'm reacting to it. And um, to our listener, Jill, that's, that's what's at play here, right? It's this niggling, why is it that Roger can't see that like one or two degrees that, I mean, I said 195, I think, but, you know, Let's let's say it's like you're you're 181 or 182 degrees, right? Um, there's a book I'm reading at the moment um, called Confidence Man. It's about Donald Trump, and I've been trying to get Roger to read it. Right? I said, "Oh, Roger, you got to read this book. It, this is this is this tells you like what the Trump administration and what his business career and all that was like." We had a we had a telephone conversation about it uh, uh, the other week, and and I you know I, I was trying to get uh, Roger to 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 read it and. Um, you know, and I think it was, I, I don't know if you dismissed it necessarily, but I think you, you kind of initially, I, I got the sense you, you placed it in the, uh, you know, in, in the category of like, oh, it's just anti-Trump propaganda. Whereas, you know, like there's a lot of stuff in there that's, that's very credible and, and it's a serious book and it paints Trump in the way that I see Trump. And when you read a book like that and you take such a book to heart, it's like if you believe in the Bible or you believe in religious texts, and you're a true believer, you, you don't understand the the world according to people who don't follow your scriptures or, or see the you know the the world in the same way as you. So I think that's that's what that that comment was about. So sorry, I'll I'll stop talking in a moment, Roger, and give you give you a go. But just the last thing I wanted to say was um, about the debate itself. Was I sort of not generous enough to JD Vance? And I I, I flip flopped on that today. So I think I was just for anyone who hasn't listened to the episode. I think you know, conceded that definitely he won the debate. But then we got into a conversation about him not being likable and that, you know, when you actually look at the sort of the, the net impact of the debate and you look at, you know, what, what are people actually taking from it that um, even though Tim Waltz didn't do that well comparatively, it, he didn't do like not do well in a way that would impact necessarily people's perception of him as the vice presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, I've, I've, I'm denied on that. And I think I'd, I'd probably give J.D. Vance more credit as a sensible, good policy communicator than perhaps what I did yesterday in, in our episode. But I'd probably double down and, and still be confident or relatively confident in the sense that I do think Tim Waltz did bring it back like when, when it counted, like where it mattered. So anyway, sorry, over to you, Roger. <laughs> Look, I think... Um... Uh, first of all, you know, <laughs> I, think I, I replied to to Jill from my my own uh, Roger in the Middle account on YouTube, saying, uh, "Hey, Jill, thanks for listening, and don't worry, Andy's still invited to the cookout. <laughs> Everyone has their limit. Andy just found his, and I do think that, like, you know, we are human, and it is is very clear to me that, and you've admitted it, that something about Trump rubs you the wrong way." enough to make you behave differently from how you've behaved before. And I think that's kind of, that's fine. Everyone finds that like there's many things that, that do that to people. For me, there are strong elements of COVID-19 that do that to me. All right. And that make me just go, Hey, fuck it, man. I'm not <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go through steps one to 10 to check myself here because I know like what I truly feel inside. So I'm not going to do that because it would just be, me being disingenuous about how I really feel, right? Um, for whatever reason, I'm not applying the same, you know, style that I usually do. So I think that, like, that's real with people, right? People have things that that, that for personal or, or whatever reasons, you know, that they just react differently on. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? Like, <laughs> And, yeah, so, so that's, I will kind of start off with that. And I also think, you know, in these conversations, what you have to realize as a listener is that, we, we kind of, it's kind of like the conversation is a space and um, Andy and I obviously fill that space depending on how the conversation goes, right? So you, and that's the dynamic nature of, of this style of show that, you know, if one person is going on the attack, the other person does try to stretch into the other spaces, right? And I think that, you know, this is, this is one of those examples too, right? Like I think that if we all just was, you know, pouring praise over JD Vance on, on things and, and not pushing him, it'd be a pretty boring episode. But saying that, you know, I, I'm just like you're reacting to some of my my um, my comments. I'm reacting to yours as well, right? So like when you're quick to kind of downplay what I what I think is a, a really good performance in the context of what's happened, I think you you know you're being uh, you're not being generous enough. 
uh, and you think I'm being too generous. And then so we have at it and I think that's okay. I think that what we've experienced would, is very, very, very common. And this is probably the true kind of insidious nature of, of Trump, just that he does, he does divide and he does kind of put a wedge between people and communities. And so I think that that is the real issue here to the fact that where I know that reading too much or dwelling too long is actually like not going to give you a net benefit. And that's kind of why I'm resisting any other books than what I have already read on Trump and Harris and all this kind of stuff. Because I feel like I have a strong enough base from what we've already consumed and anything more is almost just like feeding the trolls. <laughs> you know, It's just like getting further into the cesspit or into the gutter with them. And like you said, they're not remarkable candidates and I'm not really willing to do that. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, I, I think the other thing I, I probably react to in this space too is like often, and, and I think it, it isn't helped by the dynamic of like, we're essentially having a conversation and if you're interested and we, we're both probably slightly contrarian, at least to some extent, that we, you know, as you said, you, you, there's a tendency to kind of assume like a devil's advocate sort of position, even if you don't necessarily truly believe it yourself. And so then when that then conflicts with my general worldview that like it is correct that you have more criticism directed towards Trump because he's a figure who deserves more criticism. Like so it's it's like, you know, you, you can have two sides of politics. They should be judged to the same standard and and they should, you know, meet the wrath of, you know, the the full force of accountability of, of what's expected of them. But when you have one side that's penalized more than the other or that's called up more than the other, it, it it reflects their poor behavior or their poor actions, right? And so there is this thing that kind of comes out when you look at sort of someone like Trump where he's so deeply flawed on so many levels that he does deserve more criticism, right? And, you know, of course, if you're a Trump supporter, you'd be saying, well, that's obvious bias there from Andy or whatever. But like, against objective sort of things around, you know, respect for institutions and respect for the role of, in the office of the president, the respect for even the American people. Like there are things you can point to where you can say, well, one is scores a higher mark. So I, I think I'm quite sensitive to, I think, this notion that, all right, well, we've we've spent a little bit of time criticizing that guy. Now we need to spend the equivalent amount of time criticizing the other side as though there's some balance that we need to you know, artificially orchestrate. Whereas, you know, if we're holding them to, you know, the, it's like the referee in a, fo you know, a football match or a sporting event or something, giving an equal amount of penalties to both sides to be equal. But if one's playing dirty, then it, they don't, they shouldn't necessarily balance, right? So, I think that's part of it. And and I don't know, you, you probably, Roger, will have some uh, comments on this. But I think just at, at a more meta level, we're obviously covering the U.S. election because, um, as part of the middle, because at least of this year, it's the defining event. And um, it would be remiss of us not to cover it. Obviously, we're not in America and we're like observers from afar. But I think a lot of this stuff does affect people all around the planet. It's not, yeah. you know, if you're American, you're thinking, what what are two foreigners kind of like talking about this for? But, you know, you, they've, you've got to realize that this stuff does matter in, in other countries. So I don't think people realize how much it matters as well. Like how tightly linked, say, like Australia is to the fortunes and the, and the policies of the US, you know, and, and especially in defense as well. So it's natural. And, you know, to Jill, I totally understand that screaming at us around, I know Americans are better. And this, this kind of feeling of two outsiders, two Australians trying to provide any kind of commentary or, or views from afar. Like, I think Americans are very sensitive to that. Like um, we, we spoke about in our guns rights episode, you know, that it's a key, a key point around that, that just, you know, don't tell us what the fuck to do about our guns. Cause you do not understand as an outsider, the culture, and you do not, you don't understand enough to be part of the solution. So shut the fuck up. Right. Like I get like, that's the hardest tip of that example. Right. But for something like the election, I think it is their skin in the game for, for more people outside of America. And um, that, you know, and it's a car crash too, right? It's it's like there's there's an entertainment factor. I mean, we said yesterday that the the debate was kind of boring because they were they're actually surprisingly chummy, right? It was about policy. Like, they finally given <laughs> given us what we want, what we've been yeah. asking for, and it's boring. I know. Well, it's boring, and and then we don't want to watch it. So, 
Um, but the rest of it's pretty pretty exciting and it's pretty it's close. It's a really close election. Like I think if um just to give a, an election odds update, I saw that Trump is now ahead. So it's a it's oh, a right? dollar yeah, dollar eighty three for Trump, dollar ninety one for Kamala Harris. So uh he's taking the lead. So yeah, I, I look I just think obviously uh you know some of some of our midweek episodes account for the you know, so this <laughs> this you don't have to listen. If you don't like it, don't listen. Yeah. Actually, do listen. We need we need you. Yeah, we need we, numbers, we need so. you, Joe, and, and we need you. <laughs> please listen. Maybe if yeah. you can refer the show to some of your family that are read. <laughs> so yeah, share it for get some backup support. Very good. All right. So we we thought after a few heavy episodes we would uh, we go a little bit light. Oh, so we're not doing <laughs> so, um, um, Israel and Lebanon. For, for no, <laughs> we'll leave that for we'll leave that for after the election. So Roger, simple format for our listeners. If you can only have one thing, so alternate parallel universe where one of the following two things were missing, you can only choose. You can only have one of them. Which would you have? So you got to you got to knock one out. You can keep one. So I'll I'll, I'll give you one first. So um, Costco or Aldi? Ah, uh, definitely. You definitely have to keep Aldi. That that one's a fairly easy one to me. And <laughs> do you have a Costco membership? Well, well, well no, but I've got to say. Well, half of my Costco experiences have been with you, uh, and 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 actually in different states as well. <laughs> hey, Hank, to be fair, to be fair, I think we've been to Costco no, once. No, we've been, so that we've been there three been times, to... and really one in no. Canberra, <laughs> went, one in Canberra, and okay. and one in like Auburn or something or wherever wherever it was, and both times were a horrendous a experience. Hell like <laughs> actually, Canberra was yeah, Canberra was better, better. mildly yeah. better. Than... Um, yeah, there were less Filipinos trying to run me over with full trolleys. But uh, look, it's, it's just it, I love the idea. How many bagels do you really need? I love the idea of Costco and the Asian in me just loves the obscene kind of uh, over the top, the kind of, you know, the hedonistic pleasures of getting deals and, and all this kind of stuff, right? It appeals to me at a very deep level, but the experience is just too rowdy for me to get behind and to put myself through that. Um, it's like going to Ikea, you know, like you, you, sometimes, you know, you need to go to Ikea, right? Like there's a bunch of things in your house you need to sort out, but you just can't bring yourself to go through that, you know, amusement park, uh, of a, of a hell hole, you know, right? Like you just can't do it. And Costco is the same to me. Like, you know, if they fixed up the experience, then, um, I, I'd be, I'd be on board a bit more. Aldi is much more kind of like a real legitimate alternative for, you know your weekly, bi-weekly uh, supermarket shop. So I've got to, I've got to go with Aldi. Yeah, I mean Costco is um, it, it, it's all um, superficial appeal, but when you go there and you <laughs> like, you're okay. Costco is probably great for people with extended families and like three massive chest freezers in their garage, and you know just like a family of 10 to feed or whatever. But I just find that like, you know, a 10 kilo bag of rice doesn't tend yeah, to you're showing your whiteness. work for a family of three. You're showing your thing, whiteness you know already. I mean? Like it's 15 kilos <laughs> minimum spend okay. for any household if you're in an Asian household. <laughs> um, you, you're not telling me you're yeah, one of those I'd... guys who buy like the rice that comes in like the clear bottles that are like... <laughs> This, I, I buy the um like the the small oh, packets. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle um, Roger is going to come and like smack you with a thong <laughs> upside the head. But but a bit of love for Aldi. Like I just love the I just love Aldi. Like the efficiency of the place. Like it's just you're in. It's yes, you have to pay for your trolley, as in you know you get your coin deposit back. But like it just means that everything's where it like needs to be, and you don't have trolleys like all over the suburb. Then you've got. Um, you know, I, for some reason they have all the cold stuff first, like that's like meat and stuff. I'm just wondering if there's any like signs to that, that, that the Germans have figured out. But, um, anyway, then you have, um, like the, the checkout and it's, it's like they, they mean business, then checkout operators. It's, it has it's changed very a little bit kind of just, I'm, I must say I was a little bit disappointed with the self checkout. Um, cause I just always felt oh, that that yeah. was a point of differentiation, right? Like that they were like, no. That shit is just a fad. Um, you lose, you lose money. It's slow. It's not efficient. 
and we just have these dudes on on office ergonomic swivel chairs just fucking you know sprinting powering through olympic style like sprint of your <laughs> your thing and you better be on the other end catching the stuff um and i liked that about them but i feel like they've kind of acquiesced and and have gone with the self checkout and yeah i don't know there must be economics behind it though like in terms of labor savings yeah, um, I guess so. the the other the other thing is um just to call out they are like genuinely significantly cheaper than other supermarkets like yeah, it is yeah. like costco I, I i would never feel like i'm saving money because you end up wasting yeah, so much yeah, stuff yeah. but aldi genuinely like i i would say if you had to like pin me on like how much cheaper they are i'd say for the same like basket of groceries it's 25 percent cheaper i would say and that's that's pretty big when you think about it i think that the, the real thing about aldi not to not to go on about this too much is that it's the epitome of what a good brand should be is that over time they build up trust with you that you stop thinking about like what brand of you know canned tomatoes they have you trust that aldi will only buy good ones and so you'll then stop worrying about that and just buy whatever's there and know that it'll be a good quality cheap price and all those little kind of reductions of your mental load and stress over time is great and you feel like you're not being controlled by a little yellow sticker that tells you there's a sale and you get 50% off a tin, right? You just know and you just pick it and you trust them. And I think that's the thing that's really, really hard, but what a good brand should do. All right, so um, goodbye, Costco. Goodbye, Costco. All right, let me hit you with one that's like really trivial. <laughs> I thought that was no, pretty trivial. Going, going even more. All right, I'm going, I'm going something very Australian and maybe our American listeners may not feel the same. Pie versus sausage roll. Do you know... When I was a kid, there's no, it would be hands down like sausage roll, see you later, pies where the action's at. But I think over time I've I've grown a little bit more fond of the sausage roll. And I think it's because I don't think you can go very far with the meat pie, but I think you can do a lot of good variations with a sausage roll. Like, like so you now like there's that whole Burke Street bakery kind of thing yeah, with the pork and fennel you know like that the yeah the, there's like the gourmet sausage roll has really come into its own in a way that i don't think meat pies have that equivalent like i just i still think of like the traditional sort of four and twenty kind of sloppy pastry sloppy meat like a bit of like shitty meat plus gravy and then you know like it's it's good but <laughs> tomato sauce it's great tastes good but like i don't know you can really build on it from there whereas sausage roll i think they have so i'm gonna go i'm gonna be controversial and and say i'm i'm gonna keep the sausage roll yeah ah no it's gonna be pie for me um i just think there are too many shitty sausage rolls out there full of filler and onion sawdust and onion powder and you're burping them up for the next 12 hours oh yeah i um, I just like (laughs) yeah uh, thanks thanks for playing but a pie because because you you can get like a really gourmet pie and a really cheap one and the cheap one's still good like when when i was a kid or actually not even a kid like even a graduate when they used to like bring out the sausage rolls and party pies at like little canapes you know it's all about the pie it's all about that gravy you know like that's that's for me uh it's going to win out every time i i think the one thing i mean you you made a comment which i probably agree with which is that even a bad pie is still a good pie whereas i think a bad sausage roll can be really quite bad, bad. Yeah, so so I I agree with that. All right, what, what do you have for me? I, I'm going to keep on the Aussie theme here. Um, so sorry, American listeners, listeners, we've um, we've lost you here for a moment. But you need um, a break from us by by the sounds of it, anyway. <laughs> this one's going to be a little bit. Uh, it's going to be probably quite hard, I, I reckon. Howard or Keating? <laughs> Look, it's, it's got to be it's got to be Keating for me, and that's just more because of my leanings. But I think it is a hard one. If, if if Australians are honest with ourselves, I think that the um you know the stretch of time in the Howard years and and what we experienced from like the social side and the prosperity economic prosperity side that's like a that's like a hard track record to to argue with. And I know a lot of things people will have a lot of issue with that statement. But I think on the whole, for the bulk of society, I think that is that is a very challenging kind of record to to offset. 
But Keating just, <laughs> he was such a character and, you know, his charm and his wit and like how cutting he was. Yeah, I've got to go with Keating. Yeah, I think it's it's hard because they're, even though they're like the, I mean, of course, Bob Hawke's the other person in this mix, but like the three of them, you know, they're, they're the sort of the standout of their generation sort of thing, you know, but in quite different ways yet. So you've got, I think, Keating who made his mark as treasurer as much as he did as prime minister. In fact, he probably made more of his mark as one half of the Hawke Keating government, right? So, which, you know, if you span that entire period that they were in office. So, you know, probably his X factor is the character of the man, like him being as in not necessarily character in a, the sense of a person, but character as in he's, he was an interesting guy, right? He was a funny guy. He, uh, maybe not funny, that's probably the wrong word, but rhetorically brilliant. And um, we we haven't really in Australian politics seen, and probably Peter Costello, I'd say, is the closest we've had to, to that, but then nothing like that ever since sort of thing. So, and it was a bit of a mad dog, like that whole <laughs> notion of like, you know, going out on the front foot and then, but being sort of this intellectually able to outpace people and probably people didn't like him for that. It's the whole well. smartest person in the um, room kind of syndrome, right? Like I think that's not a very, you're not very likable when you do that. Right. Um, yeah. And and I think um, Howard on was the kind of the opposite of that in some ways. I think they just sort of, he cultivated this image of like the wise guy, like not the wise guy, the, <laughs> the wise old older guy who's been around who, you know, steady pair of hands can manage is is respectful. Is you know where yeah, he stands. Statesman. Like he's a man. He's he's got good character. Like to use that again. So, um, for me, I I would say this is really hard. Like, um, take political leanings out of the equation and just purely like, who's the defining? Like, who's the most memorable? Maybe I would I would probably say like the microcosm of of. Keating would be but um in, in fact I came into this thinking that um I would say Keating but um just to do just to do Howard <laughs> justice I'm gonna flip it and say Howard yeah I'm, uh, yeah that, that is a hard one that's a really hard one all right I've got something a bit more abstract and I think that um you can take this how you want and then I'll kind of come in afterwards but I'm gonna go with the characteristic of uh talent versus grit I'm gonna go grit and I'm going to say grit because the way I'm interpreting it, talent is almost like something you're born with. It's like an endowment in the same way as it's like admiring someone because they're born into a wealthy family versus someone who's made their money out of their own, you know, self-made man versus born rich sort of thing. So uh, I'm going to say grit to interpret that as the, the person who's, you know, come from nothing and made something of themselves. And I'm going to take uh, ta- talent as someone who was just born that way and didn't really have to do anything to. All right, yeah, let, to let get me uh, where they're at. Let me layer, peel the onion for you a little bit. Working, someone working for you, who is talented but lacks grit, and someone or an, um, an subordinate that has grit but definitely lacks talent. Well, they both sound insubordinate to me. I think if you're purely talking about what would serve you as someone who want someone to do certain things for them and do it well. I think talent has to has to win in that setting because you can try really hard but you can still be shit after it. So <laughs> um so whereas talent in some ways maybe the lack of grit partially is cuz the talent affords them to not be gritty if that makes sense. I don't know. If 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 I'm if I'm thinking about the setting, the context that I put around employees and people on your team that you're working with, I will 100% take a lazy, talented person without grit. I've added lazy in just to kind of push that point because I think that, um, and I think talent does make you lazy when you have spades of it. But I, I like lazy people. <laughs> I think, I think the spirit of laziness has uh, other benefits that people don't give credit for because uh, they do find innovative ways to get things done, and that maybe brings out the challenge of a leader to try to get the most out of this person. But it's clear to me that you can have grinders or people with grit and grinding, grinding, grinding day in, day out. And a talented employee will have moments of brilliance that just outpace them by years with, within seconds. And I've, I've seen that before and I wouldn't underestimate the power of that for me personally. So I'm going to 
give one that uh, I think will be hard, but we'll see how it goes. So primary school, which for our American friends is what elementary school versus high school. <laughs> you want to add any, anything else to that? Well, if you could only have your experience at, at primary school or you could only have your experience in high school, which of the two would you would you pick? All right. So the bit that makes this hard is what happens in place. So just just to be clear, I'm not talking about education or obviously you need to go to primary school to go to high school. I'm purely talking about your memories, your the your experiences, what um what what you ultimately remember from from that oh, time. Man. There's no question then, right? It's it's high school because that's when you become a young adult. You can be you you find your identity. You know, it's full of the excitement of coming of age. You can't you can't bottle that period of your life and you know and like it's impossible to replicate that. I I think the coming of age thing is true, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go in and, and be a little and give give a defense for primary school and maybe I'm a little bit. Uh, what did you do in primary school? Nostalgic. <laughs> well, I'm sort of nostalgic maybe as well because my son's in his, he's in his final term of primary school, so I've got that pretty much like front of mind at the moment. And I think it's just there's a certain innocence about primary school that it it's it's really your last experience as a kid i think as a child you know like it's it i think finishing up primary school marks the end of childhood in some ways because the moment you go to high school you suddenly got all these responsibilities you've got got to do homework you've this detention's a thing like and like it's all roads lead to like the hsc or whatever your final like oh and then you need to go to university you need to think about what your career like real life kind of hits you and and there's a lot of exciting stuff about that right which i think what what you're gravitating to but i think just the essence of being a child and just the like the that that you don't have any responsibilities and that you yeah the whole world is this new discoverable thing like it, 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 almost in the same way as you've mentioned like yes yeah, you know coming of age well you, you you are coming of age too at that at that earlier age too like you have these different cycles of coming of age and i think yeah, I think there's something quite nostalgic that I think I I have personally about primary school. That um, not so much for the school itself or the experience or the friends or or that sort of stuff, but just the innocence of childhood. Yeah, I mean that does resonate with me, and especially with having kids. You're right. I didn't really think about it in that way. I think that to add to that too, I, I think that if you took a poll of people, more people would have had more positive experiences at primary school than they would have at high school. High school, I think everything, all the stakes get ratcheted up and you can have like a really good experience, but you can also have like an incredibly horrible experience at high school. Like all the worst things that happen to you probably happen at high school. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I think in that, in that respect, you're right that the world becomes a lot harder. The stakes are higher and I think it's more risk, more reward because that's kind of how, the, how life is as an adult that the highs are high and the lows are low. So you experience that and maybe I'm, it speaks more to the fact that, you know, you, if, if you're someone who gets out of high school largely unscathed, then you probably do feel like that. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people don't. A lot of people experience a lot of trauma. So I think, yeah, maybe I came in a bit too hot with that. I still think high school um, in terms of who you'll be and, and the, like I said, the highs, the highs of your first girlfriend, you know, First time you drive a car, all these kind of things that happen to you because of your age. But I do, I do, you know, hear what you're saying. All right, <laughs> it's just like a weird one that popped into my head, and it's like a really like it's a really superficial one, and um, it's it's a little bit uh, it's a, maybe a little bit misogynistic. But it's like if you replaced everyone with uh, blondes versus brunettes, <laughs> if well, you had I, to give I up I one girl, I would definitely give up blonde. Def- definitely. And look, yeah. look, I'm talking about men and women, but really, I'm talking about women. Yeah, give up, give up. Really? Yeah. Can you imagine the world without, without, without blondes? Like, <laughs> w- without the, like, so many. Are there I, like a serious question? Like, because, I mean, I know that there are Scandinavians that would have true blonde 
naturally blonde hair, but like, isn't it the case that like most blondies are not quite as blonde as you would think? It's mostly artificial, like it's dyed, right? Isn't isn't that? Yeah, isn't that's that definitely the right. Case? Like, especially, I mean, a lot of people are blonde when they are kids, and then their hair darkens um, as they become adults. Yeah, exactly. But, but think of like the impact of blondes. Right, like in terms of celebrity culture, in terms of sexuality, Marilyn Monroe, like all these kind of like, you know, the the mythology of it all. Like, wouldn't the world be a sadder place without like blondes? <laughs> well, you have fun with blondes, and you marry brunettes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, look. Just a silly one. It was just a silly one, but I was just like, obviously, something would be very weird with the world. Like, if if you said no, brunettes are gone, and we're only going to have blondes, right? And I'm kind of obviously like discounting black hair and red hair and all this other stuff. But say there's like only blondes, like we're all blonde. Like, well, number one, that's Hitler's wet dream. Um, so that can't be a world that's good. <laughs> but it also would like ultimately ruin the the fact that what it what it means to be blonde. Right, this 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 aspirational kind of rare unicorn of this hair color that is so celebrated because it is rare. I I just can't like get out of my head like the image of Pamela Anderson from the nineties, like that that kind of <laughs> stereotypical Bombshell. like this is what a, a a beautiful woman looks like, and it is fairly incredible how much that's changed since that time because and and if anything i think it's maybe even coming back in vogue now but like it it just seemed like that image became so kind of prevalent in the ni- early yeah, 90s and then it just it just it, there was a reaction against it but marilyn monroe you know, yeah. you know it was probably like the world's first first like famous sex bombshell right and that that, that look has been copied constantly since then yeah Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll give you my last one, which is uh, related, I think, to this one: the eighties or the nineties. Tough one. Without the eighties, we wouldn't be here. But like, I do feel <laughs> that that all roads lead back to the nineties. And I mean, we, we we are in a high point for nineties culture right now. Um, and I do feel that it just had so much going for it that you didn't realize at the time, right, when you were stuck in the 90s. But it was just, yeah, I mean, we've spoken about it before, <laughs> you know, like it was it was such a good time. It was such an innocent time um, for a lot of like middle class people while the 80s had like this really crazy excess to it, you know. It had this kind of like unhealthy hedonistic excess to it. Uh, that that made it kind of stand out and dated a bit more, right? Um, yeah, that's my, that's my view. I think eighties definitely culturally was more interesting, but I think nineties was definitely materially or in a consumerist way. You know, just seemed to be the you know when you think about the things that kind of were launched in the nineties. You know, Windows ninety five and um, like the PlayStation and. It's a good time to um, be know, a the computer, class kid. the internet. Like it was just the it was the decade where a lot of the things that now have shaped kind of the world where we we're in today were first yeah. kind of entered, you know, in the nineties. Like mobile phones, you know, even though they I mean I literally think back that then. like for all that we complain about being millennials, that actually being a late millennial or someone who had a middle class childhood growing up in the nineties. Like, I think that that is top tier, top shelf. Like, before social media exploded, like you said, full of awesome culture, like games, proliferation, uh, like a very, you know, you've got hip hop kind of exploding. uh, You've got like, still got a good rock scene, grunge, all this kind of stuff. Like, I just think it was a really wholesome time to be, have your childhood based around the 90s. I mean, we grew up with the internet before the dark web because the internet was the yeah. dark web. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's, it's hard because we're both from that generation. But, but yeah. All right. 
my last one is going to be um, Kamala Harris or Trump. <laughs> um, Just on. <laughs> Do you, well, I wanted to ask something that just like I forgot about it and that came back to my mind. So from the VP debate, what do you think behind closed doors? Like how do you think Kamala Harris would have spoken to Tim Walls about his performance? I think she she would have said, Tim, this is an opportunity economy <laughs> and I'm giving you the opportunity to do better next time. I'm sure that's not. That could be that could be one of her many accents, actually. Now that you mention it, um, <laughs> you better thank a union member. <laughs> um, I don't know because that's a good question around like how does she actually treat her subordinates? I'm pretty sure she pulls out like the firm, stern voice. You don't get to be at that level of politics and not be like an asshole. Like you know what I mean? Like that's got to be in. You got to have that mode. Yeah, I I, I would. It would be interesting to, f- to see what that would be like, but then the same would be true for you know any politician really. Like, but yeah, make no mistake, she's she's got that mode. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I just wonder, like, <laughs> uh, I, I wonder what the actual behind closed doors um, feedback was. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you just you let it go. You just say, well, you're not going to do a debate again for me as your as my VP candidate, or unless we're we we go around again and we we've won and by that stage you'll you know like it's it's maybe you just like look okay Nick don't worry about it move on let's focus on the next like what's the point in like prosecuting the the past if it's if there's no meaningful lessons for the future yeah true and do you think that you know based on what we know about Trump's psychology you know and the narcissism do you think this man can let JD Vance have the last word no well you and I both. Well, you got me onto it, but the podcast, uh, what's it called again? The Rest um, is Politics. The Rest is Politics. It's with Scaramucci and uh, Katie Kay. The Mooch. And it's, anyway, he, he he's actually gives some very interesting insights because he worked with Trump. And, um, yeah, he had this whole piece on how, like, Trump would be seething that, that J.D. Vance did well last night, not just because, like, obviously that, that sounds weird. Like, why would he... Not just that he did well, but that like the the way he did well, like so the way that JD Vance did well was like it wasn't in a way that helped Trump. It was a way that helped JD yeah, Vance, yeah. and um and and that he didn't play like he. It was almost like I'm going to do well in this debate, so that in 2028, when I want to run for president, I, I've made a good impression, as opposed to I'm going to help my candidate win the. 2024 election my, my presidential you know candidate win the you know so all right so the real question is so yeah. the two questions are so you confirmed you know what, what i'm saying there's two possible scenarios one trump does something outrageous to bring attention back to him within the next 48 hours or two he says fuck it let's have a third debate i wouldn't be surprised if there is a third debate because i mean i think He's an egomaniac. Like, <laughs> I don't think he will. I don't think he can stand the prospect of like people saying that his VP candidate did better than him. Like he lost his debate so badly, yet his VP candidate won the debate. Um, and I think you could oversell how much JD Vance won the debate, but at least from a rhetorical or you know college debating sort of rubric of success, he won the debate quite convincingly. But whether that necessarily landed into the hearts and minds of Americans, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, at, at least in terms of the optics of debate, he hands down beat Waltz, Tim Waltz. And, and yet the opposite's true for Tom Trump in his debate. Yeah, um, I don't know. Don Trump can let that go. He wants to have another, another you, you've got to let Trump be Trump, as they say. Um, but I do think those either of those two scenarios are very likely. That's, that's what I think. I just wonder if there's like, another out there possibility just just thinking totally crazy outside the box here if jd vance like between now and the actual election date there's some blow up and jd vance gets pulled or i don't know if it's too late to even do that but um or there's some kind of like <laughs> you know public acrimony between the two i just oh, yeah 
I, I thought that was coming. I'm actually surprised it hasn't come earlier. I think it has come in his own way that they've that Trump has showed um, he's he's leaked animosity, like uh, overt animosity towards uh, Jetty Vance, and a little bit of dressing down, right? Which he probably thinks is just good for business or part of the course. But I actually think that. There's a couple of conspiracy. If I put my conspiracy hat on <laughs> for a moment, um, <laughs> I do think that and, and it got me thinking. Just seeing some of the comments on the debate, like YouTube's and different things, where people were starting to interrogate this angle of like, "Man, look at look at Vance. He's like the real deal." Now, wouldn't it be convenient, like, if you know Trump's an old man, he's like constantly being like under <laughs> threat of assassination? JD Vance could like step in for him. Right. And wouldn't it be just this thing around like actually Oh, so you mean it's like some ploy to get JD Vance elected president. And, and what do you think that Trump is like acquiescing to this? Like it's like he's just he's um he's helping his his boy get up. I, <laughs> no, I, no, no, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. But maybe the like maybe the dark power brokers of the Republican Party are thinking a little bit more like that. Well this are they gonna assassinate Trump themselves? They're gonna <laughs> well, look, there's party people and then there's Trump, right? So I'm just saying, you know, like the, the, that's what the VP is meant to do. So there's this whole speculation about will Bush come out against Trump yeah. at some point. It's one of those fantasy kind of th- propositions, right, where it, it's unprecedented. So Bush does not have a lot of love for Trump. That's... The, there's no love for Trump, and I think he could Bush could get away with it, and I think he could almost do do it, and um, like his legacy will he'll, you know, he it, it will contribute to his. It'll almost be the icing on the top, on, uh, icing on the cake for his legacy kind of thing. So it gets speculated of this possibility, but I it, the the time to do that at max, like to have maximum impact, it would be like in the sort of the days within the within a week of the actual date like so it's fresh in mind it's like that it'll take the heat out of like the wind out of trump sales for the final week um it will be salient in people's minds so i i wonder if something like that's on its way yeah the, the, there has been quite a bit of talk about that um and i actually believe that that would really move the you know move people if um if if bush took a strong stand I just don't know whether it's in his character as much as you say that there's no love between them. And I would agree. I just don't know if it's within his character to do that. I think you could do it in a way that it aligns with his character. Like it's just more, that's a bold thing to do. And it would probably mean they need to like triple his like police and secret service protection. Right. <laughs> you know, like, but like if, if he came out with like some sort of statement to the American public to the effect of, I have deep respect for the Republican Party and its and its values, the party of Reagan, the party of, you know, like that abolished slavery and all that sort of stuff. And then you go through and say, this man is not of that party and I want to put a stake in the ground. I want to mark the territory and say, this is you when you turn up to vote Republican at this election, you're not actually voting Republican. And I think that that um, you know that 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 could land for like people, and I think that would align with um, that would he'd have his integrity intact intact if he did that. And he's old enough now where he probably doesn't need to care. You know I mean? <laughs> oh, no one cares about Cheney anymore. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll time will tell. <laughs> <laughs>